Are we good? Yeah, we're good. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Primetime Crisis Live. I'm Captain Logan. Uh, we are broadcasting tonight from uh, Steve Baxi's uh, channel. I was going to say Steve Baxi's house. I guess we're broadcasting from all of our houses. <laughs> uh, but uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, as some of you uh, probably know already, we had uh, some crazy stuff happen with the channel last week, and because of that, I still have... Uh, the channel did not exist for 12 hours. We're back now. Yay. Finally. Uh, or, or not finally, but yay. But, uh, unfortunately, we still have a strike on the channel. Uh, uh, Whoa! Uh, I can hear myself. Uh, ah! Uh, the universe is gliding. <laughs> wow. There was, did, did you see that? It was talking about crisis. There were like 18 of me. Oh, oh my god. god. Is hey, Doctor that... is Doctor Doom God now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are yeah, why did he make as many Captain Logans as he made Thor's? I don't understand. Anyway, so uh what's going on right now is uh, I'm still trying to get that uh strike repealed. And in, in the meantime, uh, Steve is being uh, gracious enough to host our show for us because on his channel because we are not allowed to uh, broadcast live right now, which is uh, unfortunate. Uh, but never fear, we're still here, and uh, this video will be uh, up on our channel again tomorrow. And uh, if you're watching this after, after the fact, of course, you're watching it over at Evolution already, uh, but thanks for tuning in. Anyway, uh, tonight we have uh, three shows to cover. Um, I don't think I even introduced my co-host. It's it's uh, Steve Baxi. Hello, everybody. And it's the real Manos. Party on, Logan. We are still waiting for Dan Torrey. Uh, he should be here after a while to help us talk about Star Wars. Uh, before that happens, we're going to do the season finale of I, Zombie, and then a little bit later, we're going to do the uh, second part of our retro comics to screen series, and we're going to talk about uh, Hereafter, the two-part episode of Justice League that sort of kind of does Death of Superman. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then, of course, at the end, we're going to have an open forum, and we'll talk about whatever you'd like us to for a few minutes about uh, comics to screen. So let's go ahead and get right in to I, Zombie. Oh, let me also mention... Um, that uh, if this is the first time that you have watched live, you should go to the description of the blue chat if you'd like to chat with your fellow viewers and if you'd like to help us direct the conversation looking at all of the questions and comments over there and that will help us decide uh, what bits to talk about for uh, each episode tonight. Everybody ready? Let's get going. It's time for the season finale of iZombie. Uh, I, it's, it's called uh, Blaine's World and guys, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm upset because uh, I don't like that I have to wait. I mean, this is one of those cliffhangers where I'm just like, that ain't fair. <laughs> can't do that to me. That is not fair. Um, completely subverted my expectations, went to a place I never expected them to go. Um, I've got a, a question and concern here and there about stuff, but overall, I was just really thrilled with it. Uh, what did you think, Steve? Um, the big word that, that's come to mind, and you get a lot of season finales, particularly Arrows, where all of this stuff happens, and then the hero walks away okay. Uh the biggest word I can think of for this is consequences. Um, by the yeah, end yeah. of this, by the end of this, what Liv has to deal with, uh, the fact that the whole blood transfusion thing, the the stuff with the cure, curing Blade and uh, curing Major, and Mick turning him into a zombie in the first place, that whole conversation you have about what right she had to do that, uh, I thought this was fantastic. Um, but like you, there's a, there's things here and there, some dialogue uh, every now and then where I feel like they're kind of just doing exposition because we need it. Um, but other than that, I thought this was a, a fantastic episode. It might be my favorite, and I love that it's called Blaine's World, because it's all about how much he's manipulated and twisted the world, and he's got this warped sense of no one can hurt me now because I'm the one that, that's preventing the apocalypse. Like, he's the he's the only floodgate for what's about to come. Uh, I love all the stuff we get with, uh, with Major. The show does a really good job of directing different scenes uh, in, in, in homage to different stuff, uh, so you get like the the standard um, sitcom style stuff when you're doing when you're just having two characters interact, but then you get like a really classic detective kind of shooting for investigation, and then when you get the stuff with Major, it actually it plays like it's uh, a kind of '80s action movie. Well, it's uh, a zombie movie all of a sudden. Like that's the most zombie stuff we've had. Yeah, uh, the whole shot of when he's taking out the zombies and he's got the gun in his hand, it, it's shot like it's an action movie. He looks like an action star. It's pretty well done. Um, I, yeah, I thought this was great, and we talked a lot about how Major uh, wasn't... Uh, we didn't like him so much in the beginning, but I feel like he's come around to be my second favorite character right after Blade. Wow, I'm not even going to go that far, and I've been advocating for him most of the season, uh, but, <laughs> I, but, but, but yeah, I, I do really like him now. Um, I like what you said about consequences... Uh, so, overall, throughout this whole season, and and you know you know, um, Liv is not a perfect person, of course, and she has character flaws. Uh, but by and large, much of the things that she's done 
uh, that might have been questionable at the time have been kind of vindicated, right? Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff where, uh, or or like or like you at least can kind of see where she's coming from and why she does a thing. Like when she finally decides, I am gonna start trying to kill Blaine, and maybe I, maybe I can take out a zombie. Um, I don't find myself going, oh no, don't kill Liv. I find myself going, maybe you have to. You know what I mean? Um, and then uh, the mistake she makes in this, uh, I buy, and it's complicated, and I don't know necessarily what she should have done differently. Um, I found myself surprised, because I questioned it at first, that I bought her um, wanting to go ahead and take the cure, even not knowing if it was going to work, especially after what happened at the end of last episode with Blaine, and uh, and, and his, I'm I, I'm going to take out all the zombies, and you know, not knowing she is one. Again, stuff that we've done in a lot of CW shows lately that we discuss here on the show that I think has done a lot more sophisticated in this. Uh, that conversation at the end, um, it, he he has, you know, uh, Major is our love interest here with, with you, know, you know, obviously a gender reversal, and uh, he has the same thing that Iris does in Flash of how dare you didn't tell me, and I and it makes so much more sense here, and or not not makes more sense, but. I'm 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 with them and find them so much more sympathetic in that role because um, it's it's not just uh, you're supposed to tell me the truth you're my friend or you're my lover it's you should have told me the truth because look at what has happened because you didn't and uh, that all was uh, really sad and crazy and the big question I have at the end of at the end of all of this of course is the cure is not going to stick right. Like, 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 where, where, where I am at the end of this is thinking, um, Blaine is not cured. He's, he's going to turn into something worse, and, and that's my big prediction. And I think the same thing, of course, is going to happen to Major. I don't think, I don't think they're cured. I don't think it's done. I don't see us going into second season of this show with a perfect cure. Yeah, it'd be a little bit easy um, if we did get a perfect cure. At the same time, I'm not. But curing Blaine is so interesting that I don't know. Yeah, I know. I was about to say, like, there's no reason to cure Blaine if you... Because there's so many awesome places you could take that character now that he is human that I don't want to lose that. Well, that's true. Okay, go ahead, Manos. I'm very happy with this season. I was very hopeful that the show would be um, good in spite of the changes, and I think it succeeded very well. I think this is a very solid, excellent first season for the show. I... Uh, I like the way that, uh, yeah, we talked about a few things. So um, let me cover the fact that the, uh, we have Liv kind of enter the world as sort of a, a crime fighter, a monster hunter, a superhero, and she's not good at all of them. Uh, she's a person. She's a doctor, and the show seems to never forget that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, she's doing the best she can, uh, but she's not trained to do any of this stuff. She's kind of like going as she... As she, you know, hits every situation, and she's doing her best, uh, which I think is pretty good writing, actually. Um, at no point, you know, anytime she does something really fantastic, it feels like it's earned. Like we've seen her develop uh, to these points, uh, like that awesome knife fight in the previous episode. Um, and then she makes like, you know, mistakes, like you know, uh, <laughs> like with the like with the major situation or the um, or the hostage. Uh, situation I thought uh, well, was a you know pretty good screw up, but um, yeah, I, I I was very happy with the season. And during the major fight where he's taking out all the zombies and the one woman who works there, um, like when she like goes head first in that saw, um, yeah, they don't show us those scenes, but you know, they show us those moments. But you know, they you still feel them. And every time I watch an episode of this show, I keep reminding myself how violent it is. I just, like, every week, it's like, oh, wow, this show's really violent. I keep forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. When they, when I they, really do. When they turn, you're right, when they turn that girl around, or I forget who it is, they, they, they turn the corpse around, and yeah, there's dude. a big, the big gap in the back of the head. I was like, oh my god, you actually showed that. Yeah, um, we, we keep talking about how, at least, the, especially at the beginning, this has been such an optimistic show that I completely forget I'm watching a zombie show, and I think it's doing that on purpose. I think it is, as it goes along, turning more and more into an actual, real, traditional zombie thing, but is so character-driven and has zombies that are real people that it's going to take me there, and I'm still going to like it despite not liking zombie stuff a, a lot of the time. Um, oh, I'm so impressed with it for that. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, Manos. Uh, and this had to have been the most, the most grotesque of them. Yes, I think yeah. so. <laughs> now, <whew. laughs> um, yeah. Actually, I've been doing that a lot, just going, 
Woo! Did you guys expect Clive to know by the end of the season? I sure did. I did, too. Um, he's a good detective, too, and I kind of expected him to know the end of this season. I guess well, hopefully maybe next season. I, I hope they don't go too long throughout the show without him learning. Well, the reason I brought it up is because I would be very surprised if he didn't find out, like, like episode one or two of next season. Yeah, because... that's one of my big predictions. Like, next season, the first couple episodes will be him dealing with the zombie stuff because uh, there's just so much to juggle in this one particular episode. It probably, it probably makes sense that it didn't even to the revelation here. Um, but next season, it has to happen. Well they're, yeah. well, they're setting us up for it. I mean, like, the very last thing he does is he says, uh, we're, we're going to go after a major, and uh, I, I think that's going to lead him to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I guess we'll see. Although, I was thinking that back when Major was still a zombie. Now he's gotten cured, pro- probably, for some Maybe. amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I just thought this was a re- and, and, I'm, and this isn't a bad thing, but I thought this was a weird place to cut off the season because it just feels like it's in the middle of everything. And obviously that's what you do with cliffhangers, but with the exception of her brother being... Um, in in um in bad shape at the end, it didn't feel like your typical um cliffhanger. It almost felt more like a mid season cliffhanger. You know, it, it it kind of felt a little bit more like we this could be a thing where we came back like just you know the very next week. We're just so in the middle of everything. Um, it's yeah. one of those where I'm gonna feel yeah. the need to make sure and watch this episode again before the next one. <laughs> Cliffhangers. I'm like, okay, I know that that guy's on the precipice and that guy has a thing through his chest that he might not live. And you know, like like you always remember what the big things are that everybody's standing there waiting to see if they're gonna die or not. Um, but this isn't like that. Well, it's it's about around thirteen episodes, which is usually where the mid season um, uh, cliffhangers seem to happen all the time yeah, now. Of course, but he knew that it was that, that it was only going to get thirteen episodes for his first season, so I was really kind of surprised by where they left us. Yeah, I, I think the story the story. See, the thing is, like, I'm sure when they made this show, they weren't a hundred percent. I'm sure when they made the the last few episodes, I'm sure they weren't a hundred percent sure if they got the green light or not. Um, or at least I know they plan the show. Oh, so but, season, uh, yeah, so, yeah, sure. Yeah, they should. At the very least, they plan the season. So uh, I think it's well planned as far as like you know, uh, even if this was the only season we got, this would have been you know I, I think complete enough, and we would have been kind of disappointed we you know weren't uh, able to see you know the rest of the show and, and how these cliffhangers play out. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm very interested to see where uh, Blaine goes. Uh, with with the cure, I'm curious to see. That's the last thing I ever thought would happen. Yeah, it was a really good. It was a really good way to take him down. Actually, I thought I assumed he'd probably be killed in this episode. Um, and the opposite happened when you think about it. Yeah, um, it's, yeah, yeah, that's so cool. And and what's neat about it is it's the last thing he wanted too. I mean, he probably would have rather died than been yeah. named him again. Um, you know, he's he's in he's in so much control. Uh, but I imagine he'll try. He'll probably go on and try to keep doing what he's been doing. Although, the question is, that's how hard would it be for him to become a zombie again? See, that's the thing. Like, yeah, is he going to stay in business? Because, yeah, he's a control freak. He loves this business. This was kind of his big break. And I think he really does believe that he is uh, the guardian of the zombie apocalypse. He, I, I think he really does believe he's that wall. Uh, between well, us and the apocalypse, a lot uh, of zombies. So what he thought he had was was this this like this this situation where uh, that gave him a lot of control. Where like if uh, if you mess with him, you're messing with a zombie apocalypse. Like that's always his ace in the hole, right? And yeah. It, wonder if maybe, I could see it going a couple ways, uh, what if what he did was he said, okay, fine, my revenge is going to be let the apocalypse happen. <laughs> uh, I could almost see that, although I think he would much prefer his power and prestige. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's like Leland from uh, Daredevil. He thought he had this great backup, like, hey, <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> know, and it doesn't work. Um, so I'm looking at comments here. Just do it, says, uh, I was surprised Clive didn't find out. He agrees with this on that. Also hope it's only 13 episodes in season two. Um, I think this show is, is, uh, well-written enough that they might be able to handle a longer season. Uh, verdict is out on that for, for, for me. Uh, but it certainly is, you know, lately I just keep saying this for everything. It, it, you can, you can tell tighter stories and be less padded out, um, with, with, uh, with a shorter season. Um, but that's not to say that I've never seen a thing that didn't feel this tight and was also 22 episodes. So, um, 
nothing springs to mind. Um, you know, there are seasons of Buffy and Angel that get close, but even there, you still will occasionally have just a random kind of fun "let's go do a thing" episode. And I'm kind of, I kind of am glad that we're not doing that with this. Um, that so it, it's all it's all connected, even when it's uh, when it is mostly a standalone. Um, lots of people saying that they hope they stick with that with that uh, format. Um, a lot of people also saying that they really miss the zombie boyfriend. Yeah, he was he was a really good actor. Uh, we didn't get too much with his character, but his relationship with Lynn was fascinating enough. I wish he stuck around. Um, but I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll get something next season where uh, zombieism is, isn't as simple as we think it is. Maybe there is some something after they kind of die again. Ugh. <laughs> I just don't see it being that easy uh, that, 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 it, that it's so curable because I mean you know they are they are dead and then undead yeah um, and I mean that's a huge major risk she took because they didn't have even as much time to see the results with the rat as they did last time I don't think no no they didn't no. Uh, that can still like you get still it backfire not only does she turn two people back human but she also has wasted all of what they had. Yeah, well, one of them was a guy she loved, and <laughs> the other one was, uh, you know, a villain that she hated. So, I mean, I could see taking a chance with him, because that's kind of killing two birds with one stone by <laughs> bringing it back to life. Um, but, uh, yeah, the other one was, like, a huge risk. Um, it's also kind of a sacrifice for her, right? Because she says, you know, we can be together now, and he has that great speech that I did not think was, was, uh, was too... Um, you know, overblown or uh, unsympathetic, where he's like, where he's like, uh, well, well, but, but, I, but I don't, I don't want this. You know, like this is not how I want to. I, uh, I would want us to spend the rest of our lives. And so, um, she's giving away her chance to get turned back, but to, by giving it to him and giving up once again her life with him. Uh, well, it seemed to be a reverse of the trope. Uh, you specifically see this a lot in vampire uh, fiction. Um, and hey, I. I written this kind of scene myself, actually, where, you know, uh, vampire bites another vampire, and they can be together, and like, well, and this time it's like, I don't want to be a zombie, forget that crap, uh, why didn't you tell me, uh, or why didn't you just let me die, I don't want to eat frickin' brains all my life, and maybe decompose, uh, to be honest, being a zombie would be less cool than being a vampire. Well, in this universe, I think it'd be, it'd be kind of okay, but typically, it's, yeah. It's better. <laughs> I would rather be it's a better. universe in a way because you at least would have fewer uh, things that could kill you. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because vampires have so many weaknesses, and these zombies don't have as many weaknesses. And also, uh, with the brain-eating thing, it does seem like it might be easier to get a hold of brains than it is to get a hold of blood, although maybe... It's oh, really? I think it would be easier to get blood. I guess he's going to butcher and get blood pretty simply. I'm not sure about brains, though. Yeah. Well, it depends on what kind of vampires we're talking about, though, because some vampires can only eat human blood. No, oh, that's true. That's true, um, yeah. And well, it kind of depends on your version of vampire. I mean, God, there's Well, so does it depend on brains, too? Like, can you just go out and uh, kill a bunch of rats and eat their brains? Yeah, and then and then what kind of hallucination? <laughs> <laughs> Like, what would your visions be like? You're just like the most traumatic time of a of a rat. Like, you're like, oh man, I just had a flash where there was this time when a vulture came down and grabbed me, <laughs> up in the air, and then dropped me, and I almost didn't survive. No, um, God, oh, rat brains. That's gonna be like having little like raisinette snacks. <laughs> have they talked about possible alternative brains? Because you know what, Manish, you're right. What I said was dumb. It does seem like it's harder to get brains. Like, they need, well, they need, um, they need blame. Well, I, I'm just saying that because there have been cases in this where it seems like it's kind of easier than it ought to be, and then I'm like, oh yeah, but brains got, but but brains got a whole operation going on. So this brain. might this might be the best conversation I've ever been in. <laughs> what? <laughs> Is that a stupid thing? No, no, no. It's like, hey, what's easier to get, brains or blood? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there should be a spinoff called Pinky and the Blade. That's... Yeah. <laughs> A hey, uh, hey, viewing audience, what do you think would be easier to get your hands on? B- uh, brains or blood? I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote with you guys. I, I think it's definitely <laughs> blood, uh, and I'm, and I feel dumb for saying. That. Hannibal says uh, Major has grown on me uh, so much. A lot of people are agreeing with us that he has gotten cool. 
Um, he's definitely better. He's not my least favorite character anymore, so that's a huge step. Do you have a least favorite character? I don't feel like anybody in this is just a uh, Lynn's mom, kind of. Uh, okay, but she doesn't show up. I don't think there's She's a... not... And, and I don't blame her or even her character. I just don't think her character's been developed. I think it's still kind of one note. Um, I think you can say the same with the brother, too. The yeah, brother, he's okay. And I felt like that whole job application thing was just set up so that it would feel less convenient when he was standing there. Yeah. Which is yeah. okay, I guess, but, I mean, they did sort of make that work. Like, I could buy that he would be there right then, I suppose. Uh, but well, yeah. And there's also reason... And come to think of it, there, there's there's also good reasons that um, that Blaine gave him that, that, that job. Um, it's just... They, that does ultimately seem like a thing that they set up just so they could make that make sense. Um, well, I, I think that played out much differently than I thought. I thought he would be either taken captive like Major or or killed by Blaine, and it I, I just didn't expect him to be taken down that in such a fashion. Uh, <laughs> to be kind of an innocent bystander, really. Refresh my memory, uh, guys. Have we killed off the chief of police guy? Or not the chief of police, but the, but the, you know, the zombie police guy? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think he's been killed. I'm just so surprised that he's still alive. That actor n- is never alive for more than a few episodes, if anything I've ever seen him in. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think, hey, it's Dan Tori! Hey, everybody! It's Dan! Either having popcorn or washing dishes, I'm not sure. I'm having dinner, because I just got home from work, but I am here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Dan, we were just talking about iZombie. We're wrapping that up real quick, and then we're going to jump over to Star Wars. So, uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> We'll do Star Wars as soon as you got your dinner ready, and I, I just... You and Manos are hilarious. You're like, I'm going to set up my, my thing and let people see us doing just our normal routine. Um, I didn't want to miss it. I just have to be wearing the kitchen. That makes me really wonder what uh, the, the zombie police guy is going to be doing next season. Um, because I think they could really do interesting things and go places with him, and he could even be a big bad, potentially. And then also, what was going to happen to all those people that relied on Blaine to get their brains? Because um, yeah. if he can't get to his operation, what's going to be the ramification for that? Yeah, because, you know what? That's a good point, because that's not just a simple crap uh, line that he was pulling out to like save himself. Like, No, that is actually kind of true. He is the only supplier to this problem. Yeah, and I mean, it's also, it's not even like it's a small group of people. He's got like an industry going. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of people buying from him. Well, and remember that he turned a whole bunch of people into zombies on purpose so that he would have more customers. That that, that was his yeah. whole business model. Yeah. And you also have to assume that some of his underlings did the same thing. Yeah. Although, yeah. interestingly, I don't think anyone knows he isn't a zombie yet. Except maybe Liv. No, no but they, that happened really fast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah did Liv... I, did, did she actually see that happen? I think... Well, I mean, she suspected... Yeah, she's good at so... Okay, all right. Um, sorry, I, I've been doing lots of things today, and I'm trying to remember everything that happened in this episode because um, I just watched it. Um, but, but but anyway, it, um, oh, oh Cry- Crypt the Freak uh, in the comments. When I die, I want the iZombie theme song played at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that, that seems like it's in great taste. <laughs> I'm sure your loved ones will love that. Uh, John Gorch says that Dan is refueling his X-Wing. I guess Dan is... <laughs> look at Dan. <laughs> I guess Dan is busy refueling his X-Wing. I'm down with that. <laughs> uh, Manos, I am uh, really interested in reading the comics now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a slightly different flavor. Uh, it's got that uh, Mar- Mike all read uh, whimsy to it, but I highly recommend it. I think it's a lot of fun. Oh, and it was canceled way too soon. See, I'm assuming like, none of the conspiracy stuff is in the comic like it is in the show, is there? Uh, no. Well, there's a different storyline going on, actually. Uh, none of the supporting characters in the show are in the comic. Okay. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, like she has a couple of... She's a grave digger instead of a, uh, a morgue attendant. And like her, uh, her friends are also kind of monsters, too in this uh, small town. Uh, but there's also a building conspiracy story um, as far as like what caused uh, her zombieism and why. Because the, the, uh, a character turns her into a zombie for a specific reason. Um, 
that's all I'll say on that. And uh, it's kind of a, a comp unfortunately they had to they canceled the book, so they had to kind of rush the ending. So um, it does have a beginning, middle, and end. So I do recommend the series. I I'm hoping I don't know. I mean, it might be nice with the success of the series uh, that maybe DC would bring it back in some form. Um, you know, maybe it can be part of the new continuity or something like that. Maybe it could be, maybe not even a Vertigo title anymore. Maybe just one of their, you know, regular DC books. The I, sad thing, I think they would reformat it to make it look more like the show as opposed to what Mike Allred was probably doing with it. Uh, possibly. I hope they don't rename the characters. Because um, I like the name Gwen better than Liv. Like, Liv Moore is just like, okay, I get it. Yeah, I got it. It's, yeah, and but, then we've got, and, and she's working with a dude named Clive that has her name inside his name. Yeah, <laughs> and then, uh, and then the uh, the other guy, I can't remember his name. The uh, oh, and then Blaine sounds like Brain. Blaine. I mean, that together. Um, yeah, yeah. All their names fit together a little bit too perfectly for my liking. But um, guys, we we totally remembered this wrong. The Asian police chief uh, killed himself. He, he goes into that building and sets all that stuff on fire and kills himself. I forgot all about. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, which is sad because um, we. But that's the longest I've ever seen Principal Kwan in anything, so that's uh, that's all right. Um, anything else you guys want to mention about this episode before we move on? Um, there's all kinds of stuff I feel like uh, uh, I, I want to eventually talk about um, with regards to uh, actions and consequences and um, and uh, you know the the the, the, liv the the living and death motif in this, but I, I need to know where it's going before I can really do too much analysis on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on now to uh, the first episode of Season 2, Star Wars Rebels, if uh, Dan is, is, is good and ready to talk with us. I am ready. Okay, great. great. And then after that, uh, we will get on to our uh, retro review. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, start things with Dan, because Dan's our resident Star Wars expert, and, um, and he hasn't gotten to say anything yet, because he's just been making his dinner. So, and, and fixing his <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dan, uh, what did you think of the um, epic 45-minute uh, beginning of Season 2? It feels weird, Season 2. It's only been off air like a couple months. Um, I know, it's very strange. Of, of, uh, of, of Rebels. Uh, I liked it a lot. Um, the fact that James Earl Jones uh, and someone that sounds exactly like Billy D. Williams is in it helped a whole lot. I thought that was Billy D. Williams. Uh, I don't think it is. I mean, I didn't look up the credits. Maybe it is, but... It was I the first time. Peter ...and he sounded exactly like him. I'm not sure. And it was the first time, so unless they've recast him. Oh, okay, so then it is. Okay, yeah. I didn't realize that. Well, he's um, a little different because he's an old person now. Yeah, and James Earl Jones has a little bit of that in places, too, but it's, I think for the most part his performance was pretty good. Yeah, um, it works better, I think. I, uh, I really liked it. I mean, it was an action-packed episode, just like some of the uh, earlier season episodes, but because we were dealing with characters that I liked and cared about and you know um, where some of the conflicts are going, like with Ahsoka and Vader and their eventual confrontation, um, seeing all that kind of play out, even though you're anticipating it, is kind of cool. And uh, Darth Vader almost took out an entire fleet, which was awesome. <laughs> with one TIE fighter. Yeah, and I thought... all So all the action stuff was really cool, and... Um, I like that we're hinting at some of the character stuff with Kanan, like maybe he's uh, more of a pacifist than some of the other Jedi were during the Clone Wars, and um, he's not okay with some of the stuff that the Jedi had to do during the war, and uh, he talks a little bit about how war changes people, and um, I hope they go further with that. I mean, I didn't expect a cartoon like this to deal with like the horrors of warfare or anything like that. I don't expect like a PTSD story or anything, but um, I'd like to delve into that stuff a little bit more because I think it'd be interesting because Star Wars is all about like the action and you never really get to see how uh, the things that these people have to do really affects them in a psychological way other than like the main conflict with Luke and Vader and stuff and with their philosophies and stuff, so I think that would be interesting. Uh, Steve? Um, yeah, I thought this was interesting. Um, it was definitely a little bit more action-heavy, uh, and I, I guess I didn't enjoy it as much for that reason. Uh, the action was good and all, but I would have liked some more story material. Like, the, the episode opens with uh, a, a great argument that uh, Hera, and, uh, uh, Hera has with um, Kanan, uh, although I don't think it necessarily makes too much sense, where he says that uh, he doesn't like the whole, uh, the whole system the Rebels have got going, although he was completely fine with it first season when he and Hera had their own little... A private system going. Uh, 
So I, I, I wish we developed that a little bit more. I wish we got into the, the heads of how the rebel operation actually functions. Uh, because there was a, it, it seemed like their style was not changed whatsoever just because they were there. Yet the whole episode was them, um, them uh, rebelling against the way the rebels do things, only to find that they need them. And I don't think that, that nearly hit home as much as it should have. Uh, but the big highlight for me is the Darth Vader stuff. Um, uh, when he shows up, the way the music plays, the, the reverence they have for the character is just its great. Um, the fight scene he has with Ezra and Kanan is great, uh, and I love that Ezra says that every time he shows up, he feels cold. Uh, I think that's a really great touch. Uh, it makes him, it makes me um, really, really frightening. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of Ahsoka. I've watched all of Clone Wars. I just don't like the way her story ends. Um, I hope when uh, Vader and her have a confrontation, it, it finally makes her a more interesting character, at least for me. Um, and I feel like she's probably going to end up dying at the hands of Vader, and I'd love to see that. Um, we're not going to get another episode until the fall, so I guess we won't see where any of these questions go yet. I'm not? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of disappointing. Um, but it, it's interesting. It's a good it's a good season premiere, and I think it, it does a good job of being a companion piece to uh, Fire Across the Galaxy from a few months ago. Yeah, I had the same thing with it. I, I, I was, I was kind of surprised that they came back and did a you know, full hour show like that. I felt like there, there were a lot of kind of interesting uh, parallels and connections to that where it's like, you know, you know, we saw them on their own and getting Ezra and putting all that together and, and now that here they are functioning as a team and suddenly having to be part of a bigger team. Steve, I had somewhat similar reservations as you did as far as their resisting working with the Rebels, although um, I thought that more of what they were, of what Kanan was, uh, was talking about was more just he's not being sure he wanted to commit that far. Like, I don't know that it was so much about I don't like the way they're operating as it is just, um, like, 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 I, uh, I don't, like, little skirmishes uh, are, are okay and stuff, but I don't know if I want to be part of a war again. I don't know if it was so much that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. I thought it was more of a personal thing. Yeah, maybe so. Um, I, I only saw the one time, so maybe I, I just read it wrong. But I wish we just got into it a little bit more, so I guess that, so that would have been a bit more clear for me. What do, you, what do you think, Dan? I think it was more of he didn't want to get involved with the war himself. Um, it seemed like he, he it was kind of personal for him. Kanan has this kind of thing where he um, can be a little selfish sometimes. It seems like um, what they're doing with his character is like that's his, his flaw, at least from the little we've got of him development-wise so far. So I think, like... The thing with him is he doesn't want to see, like, the people around him change as a result of war because, like, I, w I wish they'd, like, talk about the relationship we had with Harold a little bit more because that might, that might make that stuff a little bit more heavy. Um, but I think it's mainly, like, he doesn't want to see his friends, like, have to go through and see some of the stuff that he did. Um, either that or he wants to protect them or something. I mean, I just don't think there's enough there to get any sort of, like, you know, definitive read on it, I guess. I don't know. One, I think a key line he has is he talks about how uh, he thought the whole point of what they were doing in the first place was simply being Robin Hood, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Mm -hmm. And that almost implies, and you're right, Dan, we might need more before I can go this far, but it almost implies that he sort of likes the status quo the way it is in a way. Mm, yeah. We have in common, of course, with Vader in the other direction, which could be really interesting if they if they go if they go further with that. Where I uh, where of course, in a perfect world he would love the Empire to not be ruling everything, but he also has a lot of insecurities that he's been dealing with that, that we talked about a lot, um, all the way through first season, not being sure if he's up to the task of being, you know, uh, pretty much the last Jedi and having to train Ezra and all of that, and so, you know, uh, being thrown in the middle of this rebellion and having to be, you know, like a general there and stuff would suddenly make him a lot more important and have a lot of bigger responsibility, and he's afraid he's not ready for that. Um, I guess the only question I have with that, though, is the whole Robin Hood thing only comes up one time in the whole first season. They only rob from the rich and give to the poor, like, once. The, that entire season is more of them, like, bold, uh, strengthening their forces and weakening the Empire and trying to uh, break down the status quo in areas. They never actually go out of their way to help people that are oppressed by the Empire. You're, you're right, and, and, there, and there was a little bit of confusion, uh, maybe not confusion, but just all, all through that season, we kept, we kept being like, okay, what is the Greater Rebellion? What are they doing? And the reason we wanted to know that was because Hera is involved with that, and I think maybe what they're, what they're trying to do and maybe is that what you've really got are 
several people on that ship that all kind of have their own uh, their own ideas and itineraries. Uh, you know, you've got so so maybe that's what he wanted to do, but Hera was kind of running things more, and so they were doing more things for the rebellion. And Kanan was never a hundred percent on board with all that. I don't think. I mean, he kind of just. I thought he was. I thought him and Hera knew everything together, and they just weren't telling Ezra and the rest of the crew. Okay, well maybe so. And of course, it's been a while since we've watched, we've watched those, and I never watched them more than once. But. Um, yeah, so I don't know. There's clearly a little bit of communication, um, you know, a lack of communication going on there. Um, I'm gonna look at uh, some comments here. Uh, you guys, you guys keep going. Uh, Dan, what else did you want to talk about? Um, let me think. I thought it was interesting at the end. I kind of thought that we were gonna get Vader as the main protagonist for the re- our uh, antagonist for the rest of the season. It seems like they're gonna bring in another Inquisitor, which is kind of disappointing. Yep, that's yeah. I, I have. And uh, you know, you know, Dan, the whole episode. Um, not to say I told you so, but I told you the whole episode. I kept going, oh man, Dan was right. Yes, you know. And then <laughs> because Dan and I argued about that, and I and, and he was like, they're gonna make Vader the, the main antagonist. But like, I'm like, no, there's no way they they get usual Joe's to have a voiceover, and they're 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 gonna tease us with it. I thought what they were gonna do though, Dan, is I thought they were gonna tease us Vader through the whole season, and every now and again they'd show us like something of him in a control room or something, but we were right. actually kind of, and, and there'd be a big showdown like with the Inquisitor, and here they decided to reverse that and give us a bunch of Vader at the beginning, and then you know we're not going to see much of him at all through the rest of the season. Yeah, I would imagine that the big confrontation between him and Ahsoka is going to take place in like a two-parter at the end of the season or something, and that's where he'll show up again. And we might get like one or two scenes with him. I would imagine James Earl Jones' voice work is already done. While they had him in the booth, they probably had him do everything he needed to do for the whole season. I'm sure. Yeah, they probably got him to do it all in one sitting. You know, like Zordon in the first season of Power Rangers. (laughs) Um, I had... I thought there was there was an odd line, and this is not a big deal, but I want to throw this out there. Um, tell me if you guys if you guys had this too. I thought it was weird uh, when when Ezra and Kanan have that moment where where uh, where they they say um, you know there used to be all these Jedi. Uh, they, they were they were talking about the the their plight now versus what it was like during the Clone Wars, and they say there were all these Jedi, and uh, you know you know thousands of Jedi protecting everybody, and now it's just the two of us. And then, like, two scenes later, Ahsoka is doing Jedi stuff. Well, was she, was like, never, she wasn't part of the Order by the end by the end of Clone Wars. So, uh, the way the timeline works, she's not really technically a Jedi. She just really? got, she just has the same power set. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Well, okay. But she was, but she was actually a Padawan, right? So how, how is that? She was a Padawan. Well, I mean, I don't that's want to no spoil Clone Wars. Ezra, that's no different than Ezra. Well, Ezra is tech, is a Padawan. It's just Ahsoka is just out of the order completely. She's not in, uh, following the Jedi teachings at all by the end of Clone Wars. Oh, okay. And I haven't watched that stuff, so I don't know where she where she's at. But, but um, okay, all right. I guess no, like, I'm just saying, my argument would be there is no order now. So yeah, that's fair. Uh, that, that that'd be kind of the issue of what what exactly is an order when there's only two or three people. What does it even mean? What does it even mean now? Like like is her philosophy of how to handle things? And we get to watch Dan eat the spaghetti. How, is her philosophy like all that different of, uh, than, the, than the two Jedi we have right now? No, and I mean I would argue if you if you watch the last season of Clone Wars, the Jedi changed their philosophy just to contrive a way for why Ahsoka doesn't get to be a Jedi anymore. So I, I guess it would be even more confusing if we, if we stopped and talked about how that character arc's progressed. Bamboo Bamboo in the comments says, I don't think it would mess things up too much if there's Jedi around we just don't know about. I would almost bet you money that they're going to go there. Yeah, and we've seen them do that in, like, the Force Unleashed games and stuff. They, like, rec- retconned, um, I think it may have been Shock T. She was, like, alive on some planet, and you have to fight her in that game. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of expanded universe novels that's supposed to take place, like, right in between episodes four and five. Uh, so there are Jedi running around. They just... Um, they're not the important characters from the film franchise, so they don't affect anything with the Empire. Right. Uh, Johnny John Torch says, uh, regarding the Vader stuff we talked about earlier, uh, they can't use Vader as the main baddie because A, no drama, we know he doesn't die, and B, he'd have to own Kanan. He's just too good to not kill Kanan. I agree with the second one a lot. I, I feel like the, the the whole the whole he can't die thing, well, that's true for the entire prequel trilogy. You know what I mean? Like... Um, you know, saying you can't have any drama at all, uh, ma- making Vader interesting. I, I, I don't. I resist that a little bit. Especially reading the Dark or, or not the, uh, the the Marvel comics and the Darth Vader run right now. 
Yeah, because we're fleshing his character out so much. And now, I, I I agree with you on principle that you know you know doing doing prequel stuff often that is kind of a problem. But uh, but you know if we're actually devil, delving into um into people's psychology and um you know fleshing them out, then there there certainly there certainly can be some drama there. Um, but I definitely agree with your second thing. Um, guys, I uh, I feel like this show is just a little too tame. And we and we and we've said that in the past, but I had that really hard this episode. Uh, the the business of let's destroy that whole village, but just put everyone in prison. I didn't buy that. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, it doesn't movie. like fit with the, the way the Empire handled things in any of the other movies. Sorry, what what's what's that what's that, Dan? I was just saying, I kind of assumed it was a rape, pillage, and burn kind of situation when Vader like told him to burn down the village. I was like, oh man, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed like they were they were uh, they're going okay. It's a kids show, so we can't. And you know, you know, first episode we had a sense that some of that was going on. I thought, uh, and then here you had Vader. Um, and again, I, I I loved I loved everything with him, but there was a lot of just trying to kind of PG it down. And I feel like you don't have to be really violent on screen. You can have you can do stuff off screen, but you can also you know you know have people die and have consequences. I I think people have sort of died in this series. We still don't. I'm sure the Inquisitor is is not dead or will come back at some point. Um, so, or at least. So, so did, I feel like that's likely. But anyway, sorry. What what man? Uh, so Vader like ordered the town burned, but they they captured everybody as prisoners. Yeah, this is the same guy who blew up an entire planet to make Leia talk. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 you know what else he did? Uh, he's got he's got minions that uh, fail, and he doesn't <laughs> and he doesn't force choke them. Yeah, he doesn't kill any subordinates. It's kind of weird. And I didn't wow. really understand that. I, again, I felt like it was just, well, it's a kid's show. We can't do that here. And and the problem is that they set you up for it, and then they don't do it. Like, like, like they've, they've got that one bit where it's like, um, and I thought this was really funny. Like, Callus or whoever it was was like, uh, was like, uh, well, it wasn't your fault that this happened, so uh, so so it's all right. And then and then just before he moves on, he looks at him and goes. But Vader doesn't know that. So, I mean, I guess we have to assume that Vader killed that guy, maybe, but then why didn't he kill that guy uh, earlier that failed him? I, I, I don't know. I'm just saying. He seems a little bit out of character just so that we can Disneyify it. It also doesn't fit with the whole uh, things are going to be different now that Vader shows up because they're exactly the same as they were with the Inquisitor. Um, he's, he's no more effective than he was. That's a great point. Yeah, He's just scarier and cold. Yeah. He, he, he has a better voice acting uh, actor. That's about it. He has a better voice actor, but Inquisitor is great. <laughs> well, no, Inquisitor is great too. I just, I just think you know, you can't beat James Earl Jones as Darth Vader, right? No, definitely not. No, no, so no, certainly not. You know, you know, it's funny too because when 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 they said, uh, "Hey, James Earl Jones is gonna play Vader uh, and actually be in the show," I was like, "Well, that's awesome, but we're in a point." a point now where we can kind of voice modulate anyone to sound just like that. And once I listened to him, I was like, you know what? There's a difference. They're really yeah. Good. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I will never say that again. I I thought I uh, thought that. I don't think that anymore. Acting. I just played uh, Force Unleashed earlier today <laughs> uh, before watching that episode. So yeah, there's a there's a pretty big difference. Hey hey man, I'll say that again. Acting. <laughs> I don't know why that is my favorite new thing. Mm-hmm. Um let's see. Anybody else uh, happy that we're finally getting off the fall? And more than that, we made a whole episode about how we can't go back there. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm very really happy. Uh, JID123, hey, Cap, uh, have you read the Canon comics? They add to the whole not wanting to be part of war dynamic. Uh, also, executive producer Dave Filoni said the Greater Rebel Alliance wasn't formed yet. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I read the first issue of that. I've not read any more, and I liked it a lot. I just, I just haven't continued with it. Um, good to know. Red Letter until he says, Cap, no, Ahsoka is not different than them. Um, okay, cool. Let's see. See, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think so. And also, that guy knows like six billion times more about Star Wars than me and is constantly correcting me on things. It's so exciting to actually, that, that guy agrees with me for once. <laughs> I talk about Star Wars and then that guy comes up and I'm like, see, I'm not anything like qualified to be on this show and it's my show <laughs> uh, let's see if anybody else is uh, is, is saying anything uh, the Geek Knight, yes, I'm tired of LaFall now Galaxy's a big place yeah, I still 
can't believe that we're not going to have any new episodes of the fall. So, so they, they threw that in there, and then like, really, we got to wait two months? Okay. Why did they I'm do that? I'm not even sure what the release date is for the fall. It's just we're not going to get anything for a while. Okay. Hmm. I guess they like to do little movies that are actually episodes, but pretend like they're making movies. Yeah, maybe. Uh, William Purcell, Cap, how do you think they'll explain why these Jedi involved in the Rebellion didn't help or train Luke? Well, I'd love to say they're going to kill them all off, but with this show, I can't be sure of anything because we're you know, all Saturday morning Disney cartoon about everything. Again, I don't feel like you can be vi- you, you have to be violent and freak kids out, but I, I do think you have to have you know real Star Wars level consequences. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anyone knows Luke exists outside of Yoda, Obi Wan, uh, and Bail Organ. So even if even if those guys were around all the way through, they wouldn't have any idea Luke exists. At least up until like uh, a new hope when when uh, the Death Star blows up and they sense a, a, a new presence in the Force. That's well, no, of it. course, but that's the point they're making is is well, they're part of the rebellion. Luke will be in the rebellion at least once you get to Empire. He's like a major part of the actual rebellion that we're seeing forming here. So those people would have had to have left for some reason or be dead. There was an episode earlier in the first season with Bail Organa too, so <clears throat> he's interacted with them at least to some degree. Yeah. <laughs> Cap, you have earned being right about something Star Wars. Q end of episode four. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Um, all right, anything else you guys have? <laughs> final thoughts on um, on Rebels before we uh, move on to um, to our um, uh, to our just the episode? I mean, I kind of enjoyed this episode in comparison to some of the like um, episodes last season. If they can keep up this kind of um, level of action and, like, um, good voice acting and stuff. And if you some stories in the second season that are about the characters, then I'd be very happy. I mean, I just don't want another season full of filler until we get to the next mini-movie at the end of the season, you know? Yeah, me too. But, but what we can at least uh, look forward to is a mini-movie at the end of the season and then another one at the beginning of the next one. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's... Uh, Let's go ahead and uh, move on now to our uh, retro series. Uh, we're going to talk this time about uh, Steve's pick. Uh, Steve, tell us a little bit about your pick and why you picked it, and then um, go ahead and get us into the conversation, will you? All right, sure. Um, so we're, we're talking about Justice League Hereafter, which is uh, second season episodes, I think, 43 and 44. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, and essentially, this, this is Dwayne McDuffie doing... Uh, a very abridged version of Death of Superman. Uh, the main reason I wanted to pick this is it's just one of my favorite episodes of Justice League. Uh, I was trying to find something that was, that was easily accessible as well as just uh, fun to dissect and talk about. Uh, Justice League is a show where, uh, outside of some of the big event season finales and premieres, you don't typically get the entire team every episode. Uh, and this is one of those rare occurrences where that happens, and you, and you get everyone, and everyone has something to do, arguably. Um, and I, I thought it would just be interesting to uh, also talk about one of my favorite DC Universe villains, Vandal Savage, uh, and getting to the second part and just the, the whole different world perspective he has, and how Vandal Savage might be the most objective person on, on the Earth by the end of by the end of the show. Uh, I think all that's really interesting to talk about. Uh, it's also an episode that just has so much going on and has such like a classic uh, Kurosawa film, almost Samurai Jack kind of thing going in the second half. Uh, yeah. And I think it's the perfect argument for people who say uh, Superman isn't interesting. Because uh, I, I, have a lot, I get into a lot of arguments with people where they say that Superman is overpowered. And the big um, counter I get to them is that uh, if you think Superman's not relatable because he's overpowered, it just means you probably haven't read anything with Superman in it. Because that does, never seems to be the case with people that have actually read stuff with Superman. Uh, and when you get to when you get to the second part of this, and maybe the best thing about this episode is Superman stranded in the future, post-apocalyptic world. He's not worried at all. He just starts doing things and tries to figure stuff out. Uh, you get great lines in this, like Martian Manter saying that uh, Superman is the immigrant from the stars that taught us all how to be heroes. That's the perfect way to summarize that character and dissect every aspect of him. Uh, so I'll, yeah, I just think this is this is one of the densest episodes of the the DC animated universe. Uh, and it's a good way segue to talk about how, how that um, whole production process was handled, considering we don't do too much stuff with that outside of Batman the Animated Series on the channel. Um, I want to mention, of course, that uh, it, it's 
it's death of Superman in that everybody thinks Superman dies, and that it sort of has a little bit of that world without Superman thing for a minute. Um, but of course, I, 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 you know, if you haven't watched this, there's no Doomsday. Um, he dies in a totally different way, and it's not an actual anything like a death. And it's not convoluted at all. We know exactly what happens to him, which is really nice. Uh, but uh, but that's a thing, like a thing that is inspired by Death of Superman, but they totally build their own way and tell their own story. Um, and I loved it. I, I, I and, and surprisingly, had, as I said last time, had never actually seen this one. Uh, there's some Justice League I've missed here and there. What's funny is the very next episode that comes after this is, is one of my favorites, uh, the, the Joker two-parter. But um, but uh, if because if, if, if I remember right, that's the that's the one where he like goes on TV with bombs everywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's neat and and um the way I. Uh, the way they do it with Toy Man, um, I, I at first thought was a little, um, was kind of a little easy, but I like that he goes out trying to save everybody. That it's not just a, he gets shot and he disappears, but he tries to save everybody. Um, but that second half, surprisingly, is uh, is is the coolest part. Um, and, and it's kind of neat because it plays as two separate episodes that are, you know, obviously linked together, but they have they, they kind of have different feels. Um, and that and that second part where he's like, you know, rugged mountain man Superman, uh, just just kind of surviving, um, is super cool. And I just thought of this, but isn't it kind of neat? Like they bring Lobo in. To kind of show you just how much of a void there is, because Superman gets replaced by like almost his opposite, and then he goes off, and then Superman goes off and does like the most like manly, rugged stuff you've ever seen Superman do, and he's like if Lobo was the Superman. It's really cool that they that, that they brought Lobo in uh, for that because it's like it's like no, um, you can be like that, you know, you know, masculine. <clears throat> Like been like badass and stuff, and um, still be like a, a totally good altruistic person. It's really cool to show Superman being that much of a tough guy, but not like a not like a mean person. You know what I mean? Um, j- just like 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 Superman isn't all like like roses and and um and, and sunshine all the time. And uh, and I really like that. Um, the the way he tames uh, those those uh those dogs, like like that, that whole thing I thought was super cool. Um, um, what, and also, now that you mentioned the Lobo stuff, I just want to quickly mention that Lobo wasn't actually supposed to be the, the alternate for Superman in this episode. Uh, we were supposed to get, um, if I remember correctly, we were going to get Captain Marvel, and he doesn't show up until just the Unlimited. Oh, and the idea was going to be, because Dwayne McDuffie loves balancing Silver Age stuff, the idea was going to be we, we'd see Superman harder than he's ever been, while contrasting with a character that's the, the softest and lightest version of Superman possible, the ultimate Boy Scout, and, and then our quintessential Boy Scout becoming a, a mountain man, like you said. Why didn't they do that? Uh, there was a rights issue, and they couldn't use the character, so they picked Lobo. <laughs> oh, okay. I think <laughs> Lobo might work just as well in the opposite way, though, because, like, yeah. when Superman's gone, you don't have the Boy Scout, and he's replaced by this dude that's a parody of Wolverine. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like, there's a there's a space and a need for characters like Superman, and I think, you know, at the time when this show came out, this what, what period in the 90s was this? What year? Do you know? This was oh, this the 2000s, 2000s, actually. This is what oh. 00102, somewhere around So we were just getting period where everything needed to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, anti-hero vigilante who just, who just has, uh, you know, some little inkling of a moral code, and Superman's kind of on the, you know, polar opposite direction of that. I think it's a good contrast, even if uh, they didn't get to do what they originally wanted to do, because uh, <clears throat> when Superman's not there and Lobo's there with the Justice League, they're completely dysfunctional. Because Superman's the heart and soul of the team. When you insert that guy into a team that doesn't have a heart and soul, what are they? They're, they're, you know, they're completely dysfunctional. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it worked pretty well. I mean, it makes no sense at all that they let him go with them. It's That's like, true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's here and he's hard to get rid of, so whatever. Um, and, and also contrasting him to Superman, it's kind of cool uh, that the first thing he does is he just starts creating all kinds of havoc and breaking cars and um, you know, you know all that. Uh, Manos, what, what's your take, man? I love this episode. I love this two-parter, particularly for the second part. Frankly, um, I, I think that's what makes this particular story. Um, fairly a memorable uh, entry into this series Um, because it wouldn't have been if it was like the entire like first episode we get the window dressing of the death of Superman uh, within like I don't know we got like maybe five ten minutes of that yeah and then we dig into uh, you know the low but I think I would agree with you 
going with Lobo, it's actually a happy accident. I, I think it worked out better that they uh, couldn't use uh, Shazam because because I think the point they would have been making is, oh no, Superman isn't this cutesy boy scout. He's this rough guy, uh, which is like I don't like it when people do that with with Superman and um, and uh, Captain America and other characters like that. I like the fact that they went the opposite. Like, oh hey, here's this you know tough guy jerk who doesn't care or break any rules or anything like that. And I think you made a good point, Logan. Actually, Superman is the guy who can be just as masculine um, as a Lobo type, but still have um, the moral fortitude. Um, yeah, I think and, Superman's real masculinity in Lobo is kind of like faux, like, oh, look at me, I'm so masculine, I'm overcompensating for, you know... Exactly. Inadequacies that I think I think exactly. And I, I love... And then Superman would never talk about himself in the third person. Yeah. I just love, I just love the whole feeling of that second half. I mean, it's very Rod Serling actually, because you think he's been teleported to another planet, and then it's Earth in the future, and it's ruined. Uh, I mean, yeah. And there's lots, there's long periods of no dialogue, which I think a lot of the Bruce Tim company uh, with with Batman animated series and some of their shorts and stuff like that. I, I think they excelled really well. At, uh, at very little dialogue in, in their scenes where they can tell a story. I mean, it, um, it reminded I mean, me of Riddick a lot. That's, that's something. That's something that Bruce Tim I think did a lot for TV animation, specifically like uh, all ages superhero stuff. Is that uh, he started like chopping down the dialogue? If you watch shows before Batman the animated series. They're talking like every five seconds on their shows, uh, all over. Um, you know, it's talk, 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 talk. It's like, well, this is animation. You know, you could show stuff. Um, and I, I think <laughs> it's, just, it's really true. Watch, watch any animated show before Batman the animated series. Um, you know, that's some of the Fleischer inspiration, I think, where uh, he goes back to that and, rem yeah. and remembers that. You can tell dramatic stories mostly through action, also, because what we what, what happens is you look at cartoons in the 30s, and most of them are comedies, and you think, okay, you comedic cartoons are like a couple people talk here and there, but it's mostly just slapstick comedy, and it's mostly action. And uh, Bruce Tim in in the 90s reminds us, oh, oh yeah, and I'm not saying he's the he was the first person to do it again, but um, but 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 uh, you know, a really popular show reminds us, oh yeah, you can do drama that way too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this episode is a really good example of that, that they hadn't really lost their touch when they went into Justice League. Because Justice League, they were kind of, like, doing quite a few things different, and I, I think the first season is probably uh, the least out of the seasons they did, because they were kind of figuring out how to do this new dynamic, uh, especially on Cartoon Network, and as opposed to where they were, and right. kind of building the... the DC Universe, uh, this felt like, you know, the second season is when the show really started to fill, uh, fall into uh, its comfort zone, I thought. And this was a really good example of it. Hannibal in the comments uh, makes a point that I wanted to raise. Uh, he says, um, I love the little we had a flash in this episode. Uh, Michael Roseman is so good. Yeah, uh, he was, in, uh, for me in that first part, the coolest thing. And uh, we it's just a couple little snippets. Um, he doesn't get a lot to do, but the whole idea of uh, we, we, uh, we can kind of relax because we have Superman. And uh, he he sets the example, and we just follow him. And how much more responsibility do we have once he's gone? And Flash steps up immediately. And what I love about that is that he's always seen as kind of the class clown of that group. And it's really cool that the first person who steps up and tries to start saying and doing what Superman would is that guy. Uh, and and he and I love that line when he says, um, "Well, I joke because you got Superman around. I can. Um, I don't have to work as hard." Yeah, Wally West is always the most interesting thing uh, whenever he's in anything, because he's the best. <laughs> <Yeah>. And um, <laughs> I think what you're saying works a lot uh, better than if you were to use Barry Allen for that situation, because like Wally West in this specific episode is the youngest and least experienced of them, too. Um, so that's why he kind of looks up to Superman to some degree. Uh, and it is very cool that uh, he takes on Superman's morality as soon as Superman goes. You know, He was kind of like a... 
a protege of Superman's in a way. And to, I, don't, I don't remember if they say uh, in this show, like, what's up with Barry Allen if, like, Wally was uh, the Flash after him or whatever in this. They didn't anime. mention that. But... Oh, okay. Um, so, I mean, maybe and also, interestingly, if you go over to like, Justice League uh, Unlimited, um, there's an entire episode with the Flash Museum that's very consistent about this, and, and uh, you have Orion um, learning through Batman and the Flash that uh, Wally is the jokester because of the nature of the, of the world and because of the superheroes that live in it, uh, but he feels just as much as any, any, of, the, any of the other characters. Uh, and he, he's got um, the same kind of uh, serious confidence to him as Superman does. It's just a matter of being in, in the company of the League that gives him comfort. Hmm. Yeah, and he probably uses it as a defense mechanism. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Steve, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have interesting things to say about Vandal Savage. Let's jump into that real quick. Yeah, uh, Vandal Savage I, I love when we, when we get to that stuff. Um, so... Uh, Vandal Savage is, is a really interesting character because he's immortal, but uh, part of why he's fascinating is that he's got, um, there's a character in the Sandman series that uh, gets to live forever, and every now and then, I think every few issues, we check in on him periodically, and we see how throughout uh, his life he, go, he has a whole bunch of ups and downs, and he, he takes him almost forever to learn what life's really about. Uh, and Vandal Savage is the type of character that never really figures that out. Uh, he's got this gift of being able to just to see the world in the most clear way possible. Uh, he's always very much just on an outside perspective of it. Because in this universe, in this particular animated universe, he's only tried to take over the world twice. Uh, and in those two times, it's in the modern day. It's in the 2000s. He goes back in time in the 2000s, and he tries to take over a country in the 2000s. So he's got like this, these centuries and centuries of experience where he's viewing a world, and he's kind of like a moral outsider. Uh, and it takes it takes um, being in the company of people for generations for him to hate them, but then it takes the absence of them for thousands of years for him to love them. Uh, and it's it seems to be all about just the the ability of humans to create and destroy. Because from his time period onward, they're all about just the uh, the destructive nature of humanity. That uh, that Nietzschean idea of people left to their own devices are just cavemen, which is what he was, and that's what he wants to rectify. Uh, but then when you finally get to a civilization without humans, you real he realizes that. The whole act of creation, the whole, because he's, he invents things constantly, that whole active act of creation is just disappears with human civilization. And he finally gains a new perspective and a new lease on it. Uh, when, he, when he's so content by the end of it, and still only being the last man on the universe, uh, and he's okay with it because he kind of found the purpose of life, I just love. Uh, the only big mistake I think they made is they never had a conversation with the past Vandal Savage when, they, when Superman got back. Because uh, I think we needed some kind of comparative piece in this two-parter of what Vandal Savage was and what Vandal Savage becomes. Yeah, I, one of my criticisms is, is, is exactly that, Steve. I feel like the episode uh, hinges too much on the audience having seen this show before, and specifically mm -hmm. episodes with Vandal Savage, because he's there for too long before he's even named, and that's not a problem necessarily when you have like an arcy show where it's an ongoing storyline, but these are standalone episodes. I that bothered me a bit. Um, and you're right, you get to the end. I would like to see what he's what he's like in regular present day. If it was like if it was like the Joker or somebody that we've seen a thousand times in a lot of different episodes, maybe you can get away with that. But Vandal Savage is not a real often recurring villain. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. exactly. Um, and even in this universe, uh, no one even really knows who Vandal Savage is when he first appears in the Justice League animated series. Uh, so even even in the context of the greater universe, it is still kind of confusing. You know, actually, when I rewatched this episode, I haven't watched this episode in years. And actually, building up to the end, I did expect to see like, the last scene, them confronting him uh, before he pulls off this plot. And it ends, and... <laughs> it's like yeah, it does feel like there is something missing. Maybe maybe time didn't allow it, uh, which is too bad because you know that I I I can't imagine watching this episode for the first time. You're like, well, who the hell is this guy? Um, I suppose he's bad. <laughs> It felt um, to me like it was, yeah, yeah, somewhat that it was just a lot to pack in, but also that it was trying to be maybe, um, maybe a little bit uh, uh, clever just in the storytelling at the end, where it's like, well, this is a thing we don't really need to see. We know that Superman and and, and the Justice League are going to beat this guy uh, when when Superman comes back, or that they're, that you know they're, he's going to be able to convince him or whatever. Uh, so we don't really need to see that on the screen. But I don't think it's so much about needing to see the actual events unfolded as it is just needing to see what that character was like in the past for contrast. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think another important thing to mention is uh, I was I was live tweeting this with Alex, uh, superior enthusiast, when I when I watched it. Uh, and one of his criticisms and one of the things he would have done if he was in charge of the series is make this two parter like a thirteen episode arc, uh, because there's so much going on here, and we, it's almost uh, like a clip show at a certain point where yeah. you've got all of these ideas just coming full circle all over the place, uh, and they're interesting to talk about, but not all of them are, are amazingly developed. Uh, like, we mentioned Vandal Savage quite a bit, but also stuff with Lobo, because you listen to them talk about Lobo, and they said their idea is uh, Lobo is, is a jerk, but he feels a compulsion to come back and fill in the void of Superman because he left a mark on him when him and Superman met in the Superman animated series, the episode of The Main Man. Uh, and you don't get that idea at all from the episode, and that was their intention. And you need a oh, couple more since, episodes with that yeah, to make that make sense. The sense I got was just here's here's an opportunity to strut my stuff. Yeah, it, it wasn't supposed to be that. It was supposed to be more of just uh, a booster goal type of situation. They they couldn't convey that properly. That's kind of neat. Uh, you know, if if we'd actually if we'd actually dealt with that. Yeah, I mean, if we did this in comics, this would this would be a wonderful you know full year or twelve issue kind of thing. Um, you know, to, to, and, and I feel like you could even do several issues of what Superman's doing in the future. Um, yeah, and also just an interesting question of what is the Justice League without Superman? Because uh, it's one thing to have an equal power set. Martian Manhunter is more than a match for Superman. Uh, but having the moral compass like we keep talking about, uh, what's it like to be in a Justice League that doesn't have the hero that inspired the creation, the creation of other heroes, both in fiction uh, and outside of fiction, uh, outside of just in, in our regular universe, the first superhero being Superman, and everyone saying, what's your ideal just superhero team? And everyone has to mention Superman somewhere. Uh, and th that's questioned quite a bit, but I don't think we ever get it discussed enough. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like what you're saying, Steve, is just the idea is too good for yeah. the small, the, this, this short of, of, of material, which is, which is really interesting because it's, it's a, it's a two-parter. Um Dan, we haven't heard much from you. Uh, anything else about this you wanted to you want to chat about? <clears throat> Nothing that you guys haven't really brought up. I mean, um, I uh, I thought it was cool for, uh, this episode. This weather wizard, because I like weather wizard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it got kind of an eclectic assortment of villains to put together uh, for that pact, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it was. It was the wizard has this like big beef with Superman. Uh, like he's at the table, like stabbing Superman's symbol. I was like, "What does Weather Wizard care about Superman?" <laughs> Is there an episode dealing with him? Yeah, Weather Wizard first appears in Superman the Animated Series. Him and Flash are doing a charity race, uh, and oh, Superman and Flash stop them. Yeah. Uh, it's called Speed Demons, and it's actually a pretty good episode, but it, it's kind of melodramatic that all these Superman villains have a cult together where they stab symbolically a symbol of Superman. Uh, that's, a, that's a little strange. It was a bit. It's like, didn't they know each other when they walked in? It's like, they yeah, already it, have costumes. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I, don't need to. I was ready for the paddle of shame or something. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, how... I, 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 I kind of feel like this episode maybe would watch better in the sequence because it sounds like it's paying off stuff and doing a lot of continuity things. Well, there is a cut sequence, sequence where uh, they put on their robes and then after they are done agreeing to kill Superman, they go in the next room and tell Tom Cruise to take off his clothes. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, it, it, it reminded me a little bit of of the, uh, of the of the League of Superheroes from the live action Tick. Uh. <laughs> well, there's an episode of Gravity Falls that has a group like this. The um, oh god, the Unseen Eye, I think, is something like that. Oh, uh, where they uh, wipe people's memories who see weird things. And it's funny after they're done with their meetings. They tell each, they as they walk out the door they they uh, they tell each other unsee you later unsee you later unsee you later. <laughs> uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is I really I uh, dug the way Batman's uh, grief was handled. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. The, yeah, the beginning of the speech that gets interrupted that he has at Superman's uh, um, memorial uh, because you you know he. He doesn't think that Superman's actually dead, but then he's afraid that he might be, so he's not going to let anybody know what he's doing, but he secretly is really tore up about it. Um, yeah, that whole thing that whole thing was cool. Um, you, you never see Alfred in the show. Um, he's only like three episodes in the whole run, I think, of just <laughs> yeah. Justice League Unlimited. <laughs> he appeared in the uh, the Hawk uh, 
uh, Hawk People invasion. Yeah, episode. he's in Starcrossed, he's in this, and he's in um, Secret Origin once, I think. Does it bother anybody else that Steve knows this show this well? Nah. That's amazing. <laughs> I not 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 bother is in it's a problem. I just I just mean man, I I hey, wish man, I knew this show that Hey well. man, I knew that stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you name the show by episode title? Uh, uh, okay. no. I know Alex can do that though. Well Steve oh, that's good. a little bit. I was just asking Manos. I don't think he speaks this episode title even as well as Steve does probably. Maybe he does though. Uh, maybe uh, not. Maybe I not. I'll admittedly, okay, I don't. I know the Christmas episode, and I know the Joker episode. <laughs> uh, anyway. I, don't know it as, I don't know it as well as um, Bat, uh, Batman Animated Series. I still am pretty yeah. uh, very articulate about that, that uh, series as a whole. Are you fluent? You're fluent in Batman the Animated Series. I am, yes. All right, uh, let's let's uh, see if anybody has got uh, some more questions, real quick, in comments before we move on. Uh, people are already asking things for the open forum. Um, somebody asked when the Bronze Age in comics ends. Uh, I, I just I just noticed that and thought it was kind of funny that somebody asked. That. I I want to say it's eighty three. 84, it's somewhere in there. The Bronze Age? Yeah. Well, the Bronze Age? Um, I thought a lot of people, like, connect the end of that to, uh, The Bronze Age. Oh, jeez. Because I think Modern Age starts mid to late 80s. Uh, yeah. 85, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's weird. We we don't think of it like that, but yeah, that's that's uh, and and I learned this doing uh, eBay ads because uh, because because eBay actually does its categories by that, and it's it's con it's consistent with how it's uh, you know considered product dimension. It's weird. You think at some point we're gonna have to name a new age, guys, because we've been in the modern age for as long as a lot of us. A while, have. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a problem. Um, well, I'm not seeing a lot more stuff about this, so uh, we're gonna go ahead. Hold on one second. Superman, go bye bye. Vandal Savage looks like Tony Stark. He does kind of look like Tony Stark. Yeah. That's true. I'm seeing a lot of things about other things. Um, why don't we go ahead and uh, move on here to the open forum. At the end of the open forum, Manos is going to reveal, reveal to us what we'll be watching for next week for the Metro series, so we'll start with that. I know I am! And now it's time for the open forum. So for the next uh, ten minutes or so, uh, we'll run a little bit late. Uh, next ten minutes or so, we're going to answer uh, some of your questions and comments uh, about other comics to screen things, anything you want to talk about. Um, I know everybody's going to ask us about uh, Punisher. Um, I, me and uh, Vince have already kind of set our piece on that, so I'll let you guys talk a little bit about what you think of the uh, pick for Punisher and what we're doing for uh, Daredevil Season 2 so far, as far as we know about it. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Wait, what? Sorry? Um, how do you... How do you how it's do you coming feel? out on me. Oh, is it? Yeah. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. How do you feel about Punisher being added to Season 2 uh, Daredevil and the uh, choice of actor? Oh, um, <laughs> the only thing I've been is uh, Wall Street, and uh, he's pretty good in that. He doesn't uh, have a lot to do other than be like a typical macho man kind of guy. He's kind of a... Um, he's not like the main character in that or anything, but his performance in that is good. Um, I don't watch Walking Dead, and I guess he was the pick for a lot of fans based on his performance in that, so I can't really say. Um, I think he looks like the Punisher, and... Um, I'm really glad that the Punisher is going to be in the show because one of the best issues that Frank Miller uh, had in his run was an issue where Daredevil and the Punisher confront each other and their sort of philosophies are confronted uh, are and contrasted. And I love that issue, and I hope they do a straight-up adaptation, but, you know, elongate it throughout the whole season. And, uh, you know, I love whenever those characters interact post that, too. Like, one of the uh, more memorable things that Mark Wade did during his run, I think, was the crossover... Um, uh, between the Punisher, Daredevil, and Spider-Man and contrasting those three characters was really interesting. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd really love to see Spider-Man on here too, but the fact that we're getting the Punisher is really, really exciting. Um, I hope they spin him off into his own show because 
you know, I think that's where he belongs. I don't know that he belongs on the Defenders because they're all characters that don't kill people. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think it would be awesome to have his own show in that kind of pocket of the Marvel Universe. I think he'll be in the Defenders in, in places, but, like, actually have to, you know, confront them and deal with them. I, I, Vincent, I said that, too. I'm like, I really doubt he'll actually be a Defender. Uh, yeah, I hope it's not the kind of goofy thing they do in the comics sometimes where he works with characters that uh, don't kill, and he's like, don't worry, I'm using rubber bullets, and you're like, rubber bullets, if you shoot people in the right place, can kill them still. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> Punisher, a paintball gun! <laughs> uh, anybody else want to speak about uh, Punisher before we go on to more questions? Um, I've seen the actor in uh, Fury and the Walking Dead, and uh, he seems to typically play like the same kind of guy and everything, uh, but he's a good actor, and I'm really glad he got cast. Uh, I still would have picked, like, Jeffrey Donovan over him, but that's okay. I still think this guy is going to be uh, awesome as the Punisher. Uh, and like Dan said, I can't wait to see if they do, like, a competing philosophy between him and Daredevil. And uh, maybe even if uh, we get a thing where the Punisher is basically the main bad guy for the whole season. Um, like, I think that would be endlessly I think that would be endlessly interesting. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily need, like, another big supervillain plot like the Kingpin. I think you could get away with just doing 13 episodes of Daredevil versus Punisher. That would be wonderful if he could be... Um, maybe not so much the lead villain, because I know a lot of people don't think of him as a villain, but um, uh, he could at least be the lead antagonist, yeah. uh, where he has his agenda, and uh, Daredevil has his agenda, um, and nine between shall meet. Like, you know, you know, maybe, uh, maybe Matt Murdock is uh, defending somebody he thinks needs to be killed, um, and, you know, we could see that you know, play out throughout the storyline. And then when they, if they do that, then when they put out the box set, they can have the cover of it be the original cover of the Punisher, except put Daredevil where Spider-Man goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hannibal asks, uh, did you guys see the three-part Justice League uh, Gods and Monsters miniseries, and what did you think of it? Uh, we kicked around maybe reviewing that here on the show. Uh, I didn't want to add it to this week because I didn't realize that, we, that it was done already. Uh, is it really just three-part? Is that... It's three parts, and uh, there's a second season that got greenlit that's going to be ten episodes, uh, but that's it doesn't have a release date yet. Oh, it's okay. I thought that whole thing was just a lead-up to a movie and that it kind of wasn't really important and didn't matter much. Uh, but if they're making more of it, then then uh, it's technically sort of a TV show, So uh, even though it's just on the Internet. So I, I guess I guess some of us, if, if we want to, can tackle it. Um, I'll watch it if Steve uh, wants to watch it. Uh, and I've then already watched it, so... Oh, you've already watched it? All right. Well, then, well, then um, I'll, I'll waste my time watching it. I'm kidding. We'll see if it's any good. Um, I'll, I'll watch it, too. We'll talk about it next week. It'll give us some extra stuff to talk about on the show. Um, and then uh, if you guys uh, want to do that, feel free. But uh, don't feel like you have to. We've at least got two of us that will have watched it. Um, I, I have watched two of them. I watched the Batman and Wonder Woman ones, and I uh, thought they were okay. Well, watch the last one because it's five minutes, and then, and then if you don't like it, you can just complain and complain, and it'll be totally fine. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, so anyway, that's our answer to that. Um, what else? Uh, hey, JID one twenty three. Uh, so so uh, this is a video game question because uh, Dan and I just did a video about E three, and now all of a sudden people think that I know something about video games and what can I do? Is uh, incredibly flattering. Uh, by the way, um, I, I I I should probably uh, announce to folks because people keep asking. People are so worried that I'm not going to be able to play uh, Batman Arkham Knight, and are super worried that I'm not that that, uh, that that they're not going to get a review of that. Um, I am getting a PlayStation Four. Um, the uh, day Arkham Knight comes out, uh, it's going to be in the mail on Tuesday. I just ordered one, uh, and uh, I will be playing that game, and I will be able to um, you know do that with the podcast. Uh, Dan's news and I talked today, and we're definitely doing that. Um, people have been asking me like crazy about that. So that is happening, folks, uh, and I'm going to be able to play modern games again because I'm getting a PS4, yay. Um, things that aren't Nintendo. And there's a lot of cool stuff coming out, so I'm kind of excited about it. His question, uh, GID123, is uh, what are your thoughts on Battlefront 3 not having a single-player story mode, space battles, Galactic Conquest, and 20 versus 20 multiplayer? Um, okay, so I don't know what that last thing means, but um, I, I, I didn't realize that there wasn't going to be a, a, a single-player story mode. Um, that's a bit of a bummer to me. I don't mind the space battle thing. Uh, Dan and I were talking about that. Um, but if it's Mostly just a multiplayer thing. I'm not anything like as interested as I was. Before. There is a single player mode, and it's like <clears throat> missions based on uh, moments from the movie. There's not like a 
connected storyline because if there was a storyline in Battlefront, uh, specifically if we're doing just the battles from the movies, you could just watch the movies and that's the story. So it doesn't really make sense to do a storyline overarching, I don't think. Unless you're focusing on, you know, one specific stormtrooper or rebel and... I don't know how you would make that any sort of interesting either. So um, I think the way they're doing it is cool. one of those battles. We had one stormtrooper that was in every single battle you saw in Star Wars. Yeah, so they're they're doing a single player mode, and uh, there's no galactic conquest, which was a mode in two where you could sort of strategically conquer planets in the galaxy and stuff like that. I mean, I would like to see that. We don't know all the details of all of the single-player modes yet. They just revealed the uh, single-player mission modes. We didn't even know there was go- those were going to be in the game until E3. So I think there's stuff to come. Um, the, the space battle stuff, I didn't think the space battles were fun in 2, so I'm not really, uh, you know, angry about that. And they're probably going to do a revival of Rogue Squadron in the space combat will be much better because it's a game focused specifically on that kind of combat. So... I don't know. I think I'm just really happy that we're getting another good Star Wars game and we're not just relegated to putting out Force Unleashed games every so often, which the story doesn't make sense and they're not really all that fun to me anyway. So, I mean, I, like I don't know. I like the first one a lot, Dan. I, 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 I like the first one a lot. Yeah, yes, I mean, I disagree with you there. I didn't think it was that fun personally, but... <laughs> um, I like it. Can I, is, that okay? is it okay with you? Can I, can I like yeah, it? yeah, I mean, uh, I just, I'm just happy that we're getting a, a Star Wars game that has so much reverence for the original trilogy. I mean, these people are going to put this film vaults and 3D scanned all of the, mo- the original models from the movies and stuff, and there are 40 on 40 battles, um, so it's bigger than 20 on 20. I don't, I don't know um, why that's a problem, but... Uh, I think that's cool. <laughs> as long as I can play by myself, that's totally cool. I yeah. just, I'm not a big multi, uh, multiplayer guy. Uh, people think I'm weird for that. I'm an old person, apparently, when it comes to video games. Uh, <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I didn't grow up with that. It's not my. I, I do it with some things. I do it with Mario Kart and stuff. I don't play multiplayer enough to have to pay every month to play multiplayer, so I'm just not going to. But so as long as I can play by myself, um, and if they have local, uh, I. I multiplayer, then that that would be awesome. Yeah, there's local multiplayer for that. Oh, for good, sure. good, good. But the missions that I was talking about, the single-player ones, those are co-op as well, they announced. So you'll be able to play through the story missions uh, with two people. Then that sounds wonderful, and I don't care that it's not linked. That's, yeah, that's great. Cool. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the information. No problem. <laughs> if I want I want to want to want that game. That makes sense? What I just I'm really excited about it. But I, I do. I want to want that game. Anyway, um... Okay, let's see. What else? Not call it a hey, cap. It's being reported that CW is developing a standalone hot girl show. What do you want to see out of it? Uh, uh, mythology for Hawkman that makes sense. That'd be good. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that's not written by Rob Liefeld. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, my big thing is, I hope I end up liking that character. I mean, if they're already developing a show, we haven't even done anything with her yet. I have no idea if I'm going to like that character. So, I don't know. Um, if they got to just put out a bazillion of these things uh, all, all interconnected, I just show they're fun, because you know, we review them all, and I don't want to have to watch bad things all the time. That's why I really <laughs> hope I don't have to watch Hawk Girl to understand The Flash. That's one, one, my one reservation, because I don't really want to watch that show. I don't have time, and I don't care about Hot Girl. <laughs> I don't either, but I could be made to. I mean, I always have an open mind about stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I have to be selective about the shows that I dedicate my time to, and I, that Hot Girl would not be one that I would, you know, immediately um, be, like, on the bandwagon for, so... That's true. I have to remember that people's perspectives are different from mine, because, you know, I, I kind of watch superhero stuff from my job, and other people have <laughs> jobs, so... <laughs> Superman Go Bye Bye says that Dan's news is the reason that he found the channel. That's cool. Thanks for thanks for hanging out with us. Dan's news is awesome. Oh wow. Okay. Um, this is this is kind of a this is kind of a writing prompt. Uh, Soundwave seventy one cap. Whenever you are writing a story, does the city that the main character lives in comics define their character themselves, or does a main character that lives in a city define the city? What I mean by that is that some people say Gotham defines Batman's character, and some say that Batman defines and represents Gotham City. 
Uh, I mean, both. It kind of just depends on what tack you're taking. Um, you know, you can you can you can certainly uh, go either direction with that. Um, you can also have kind of a chicken and the egg thing, obviously, um, where it's where it is both or difficult to tell, kind of undefinable. I think often Batman is that way, uh, where, where it's where it's difficult to tell. Um, I would say that, for example. Um, uh, the, the same is kind of true both directions with uh, with Superman and Metropolis in a way. Um, I mean, I think Superman is more defined by his upbringing, um, but I think uh, Metropolis is often a city that would not look anything like it, it does if it weren't for the fact that Superman was there. City of Tomorrow and all of that. So mm-hmm. uh, it just depends on who we're talking about, I think. And then, of course, uh, when you get outside a superhero, you have a lot of characters where, um, where they live... Uh, uh, is not impacted by them at all because they're small, insignificant people to the rest of the world. But we care about them <laughs> because of uh, what they do in their own little, little personal life. I think the Marvel characters being New Yorkers is a big part of a lot of them too. <clears throat> um, yeah, specifically I, like Spider-Man and, and Daredevil and stuff like that. I tend to find uh, the city defines the character a little bit more interesting, frankly, a little bit more realistic, where the uh, the character ends up representing whatever the city uh, is as a whole. Uh, rather than the reverse, or even uh, resist it if it, if that character doesn't like what the city represents, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite a bit of that uh, in Iron Man when he gets Dennis and Neil's run and he moves from New York to uh, San Francisco, uh, and he he has to, like readjust his life because of where he lives. Why does everyone leave New York and go to San Francisco and Marvel? Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, this was during the '80s. There was the whole Silicon Valley boom, so it made more sense there. Hmm. That's the one other city Stan Lee had visited on the West Coast, and he's like, hey, what's going up there? <laughs> uh, William Purcell, a lot of uh, X-Men fans think that Marvel is downgrading them in the comics. X-Men merchandise is being canceled, no animated series, uh, twins relation to Magneto, and the Inhumans being brought in to replace them. Do you believe it? Yeah, to a degree, certainly do. Um, I think there is a degree of that happening. Um, I'm the verdict is out as far as the comics go until we get past Secret Wars. Um, I'm I'm a little bit nervous about how much X Men we're going to have and what exactly it's going to be. Uh, the whole Uncanny and Humans thing as a title being the first thing that was advertised in the first issue of Secret Wars kind of kind of freaked me out. A little, not freaked me out, but I, I was I was a little bugged by it. I just feel like that is potentially representative of what they're. Uh, of, of, of how they're trying to sell Inhumans. And obviously, there's a lot of trying to make the comics look more like the movies right now, and clearly the Inhumans are, are there and we don't have X-Men in the movies. Um, Verdict is out. We'll see how it goes. I don't like that they're canceling merchandise. That kind of... That, that, that's telling to me. That yeah, all the merchandise stuff is really weird. Like, they're photoshopping the FF and X-Men off of t-shirts that have, like, Secret Wars covers on it and stuff. Oh, and other characters which is really cringe. And they, Marvel made them, um, uh, some, like, Sideshow and some other statue companies cease all production on X-Men and Fantastic Four characters because they didn't want that merchandise out there for whatever reason. Um, and all new Marvel soldiers can't have the FF or X-Men on them. Fans on Twitter uh, that accuse him of hating the X-Men and erasing... Potentially erasing them after Secret Wars and saying, "Look, like everyone at Marvel here loves the X Men. Like they'll be around after Secret Wars. Don't worry." But to what degree they're going to be different? I mean, who knows? So, I mean, I don't think you have all that much to be worried about in terms of the comics. And if the X Men go into their own pocket and kind of do their own thing for a while, I mean, I'm not all that opposed to that in the first place anyway. I actually really like that idea. If, that, if that's what's going on, and we still have several X books, and they just are kind of getting away from what the regular Marvel universe is. They work better on their own anyway. A lot of this. I mean, I, the more book is untangled with whatever events are going on, the more so that that's the case. I'm happy. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Not, not having to filter them into the to the rest of the uh, of the books or, or big events and stuff. No, that's yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I have enjoyed all of the Avengers crossover stuff in finally saying, "Hey, I uh, Captain America." You're a man of the people, right? Seems like you should have been paying attention to this whole people being bigots toward mutants thing. <laughs> so, I mean, I like that we did all that, but we've kind of been there and done that now. I don't know that I need more of that. Uh, so, yeah. No, Dan, you make a really good point. No reason to freak out yet, but I think there's a little cause for concern. I can see why people are reacting. I'm just resistant to this actually going through because I just... Yeah, I know... I know Marvel wants to make uh, things like their movies, and I know they're feuding with Fox, but I just X Men is just such a money maker for them, and it's just hard for me to believe that they would do such a thing. Um, it just seems so counterproductive. Uh, I mean, we'll wait. I mean, I'm like I'm like you guys. I'm waiting and seeing like what they do. 
Well, I, I think the cause for concern comes from what they've already revealed they're doing with Fantastic Four and how that, like, Ben Grimm is a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and the Fantastic Four won't have a book after Secret Wars. I mean, that's kind of weird. I kind of, I wholly, wholeheartedly resist that idea. I mean, you're going to, like, not publish the, the comic book that started Marvel in the first place over some kind of rights dispute? That's ridiculous, you know? <laughs> it sounds insane. And to be honest, I mean... Uh, I mean, how long do movie franchises last? Um, I mean, maybe five, ten years? I mean, how long does a comic book franchise last? You know, decades and decades. Um, you know, my hope that even after this dispute, you know, even if it does go to the point where they downgrade these characters and uh, splinter them in different sections in different areas of the universe, um, my hope is that it would at least come back because, look, I mean, how long is Fox really going to make... FF movies, like maybe two or three until they lose rights or lose interest. I don't interest. go any farther than that, and if they don't if they don't go any farther than that, I don't see them re rebooting it again necessarily, but look, if Marvel's whole strategy when it comes to Fantastic Four is... Because, you, you, know, you know, I've heard people talk about this in different ways, and some people seem to think that they're just angry at Fox and they're kind of just, you know, you know, trying to kind of get their revenge by not about publicizing their movie by not publishing Fantastic Four. I think it's more likely to be a marketing strategy, but I don't think the marketing strategy makes any sense. If they're saying, if we downplay FF more, we might be able to hurt that movie enough that they don't make any more and then we can get the rights back faster, that doesn't make any sense. I, I know exactly why they're doing that, and this is something that Chris Claremont has talked about when he got to write X-Men again. <clears throat> he said that the mandate at Marvel is you're not allowed to create any new X-Men characters in the books because those characters could potentially use to make money by Fox in the movies because they automatically get the rights to any character that's made in the X-Men comics in the movies. So Marvel wow. says, you can't create any new mutant characters in the book they said that to him. I don't know if that's the case for everyone, but that's what he was told. So I assume that they're not publishing a Fantastic Four comic because they don't want any potential story ideas to filter into what Fox does in the movies and potentially make them any sort of money in that way. Because I'm with you. It doesn't make any sense to not have an FF comic in a niche medium that not nearly as many people uh, have their eyes on. In terms of line. Yeah, and there's a loophole, and this might be a stupid loophole, but there's a loophole they could go with, Dan. They could just, every character they create for X-Men, start in a book that's not X-Men related, and then move them over. Because if they're not there, then they wouldn't have the rights to. What's that, Dan? But if they're mutants, that's technically part of the X-Men umbrella, so they would be able to use them. Oh, Nobody yeah. that's a mutant can be a new character. Oh, no, you're right, you're right, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, Sabretooth, Sabretooth isn't a Iron Fist character, he is a X-Men character. Yeah, okay, well, um, see, I'm not a genius or anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, let's answer one more question real quick. Uh, let's see what folks are saying. Um, thank you guys for being with me tonight, I appreciate it. No problem. Oh. No yeah. problem. I love it. Um, looking for cool questions. Cool questions! Oh, here's a quick one for Steve. Quick one for Steve, and then we'll do one more. Sandwave 71. Steve Baxi, if you were to write a story on any specific Transformer character, Autobot or Decepticon, who would you focus it on? Uh, I would love to do a entire Transformers ongoing on Starscream. Uh, I think it would be really fun to do a book that focuses on uh, nothing but Starscream's ploys for power and kind of make him Cobra Commander without anything to command. Uh, just do a whole thing where um, the Decepticons have got their own interpersonal relationships and uh, problems with the Autobots, but also problems with the internal power, power structure. And a lot of that's a Starscream manipulating people, but the manipulation's more often mistakes than intentional plans. Uh, I think that could be a lot of fun. It could be also an interesting social commentary on the problems of authoritative governments. Uh, and the, the problem of everyone vying for power, uh, maybe make Starscream kind of like a failed Hitler in that he wants to he wants to seize power by being in charge, but he can't be in charge at all. Wait, have you have you given this a lot of thought, or did that just come to you, Steve? It just came to me. I'm not even joking. Wow, that's that's cool. There there you go, Steve. Steve uh, Steve doesn't mess around when the questions are are. Uh, <laughs> Uh, comp sci-fi uh, or sci-fi theater guy, Cap. What's the one thing that will make 
Arkham Knight a disappointment for you? I love that he says will make. Like, Arkham Knight is definitely going to be a disappointment. <laughs> well, no! Will it be a disappointment to you? How will Arkham Knight be a dis- It's a foregone conclusion. Okay, before I answer that, first of all, let me say that um, a lot of people already know who Arkham Knight is because pe- because uh, 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 folks have gotten to review the game and there's already gameplay up and stuff. Um, I-, I want no one to tell me anything because I want to find out things uh, uh, within oh. gameplay. Um, I'm going to play next week. Um, so uh, so I-, I-, I feel like answering this is weird because most a lot of you probably already know who that is. I don't want to know until I've played the game. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm really irritated sometimes with um, with like uh, everybody knows things like three weeks before a com- thing comes out and it's really hard to avoid finding out stuff. Like, I want to like experience the thing and find out. It really messes with your perception of the thing uh, if you don't get to find out those things earlier. And you can say, you can say, well, Cap, you t- you talk about news all the time, and I'm like, yeah, but that's like a like major third act plot point stuff. Um, I, uh, if it was Alfred, that'd be, that'd be bad. That'd bother me. <laughs> not like that Neil Gaiman story where, uh... He was the Joker. <laughs> yes, and uh, whatever happened to the Cape Crusader. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe if it turns out to be, uh, Ace the Bat Hound, I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel. Oh, I would love to be. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be disappointing. That would, you know, there's a different word for that, and that is that is flabbergasted. Uh, actually, is what I would be if it was Ace the Bat Hound. I would just love to see the re- collective like reaction of everyone on the internet, like freaking the heck out about it. <laughs> that would be my favorite thing. <laughs> Steve, um, I know you already know who it is, and you said that you're sort of disappointed with it. Do you think that after you played the game, you might change your mind? I really doubt it. It's, I mean. Knowing who it is tells you almost exactly what the story is going to be, uh. and knowing that that's the story really bums me out. Um, it, it, it's exactly it's it's exactly the wrong direction to go with this type of game, uh, and it it, it uh, makes a lot of my predictions come true, and I just didn't want that to happen. So, uh, I, I, I really ruined it for me. It's the wrong direction for the story. I mean, maybe they do it better than you're thinking. You know? I uh, see. I don't know because the only way you make this character. Arkham Knight is to do this particular story. There's no other way, uh, especially considering the, the way they structured the first two three games. Uh, it, they they've addressed the continuity in such a way that to do this would would involve a, a very particular adaptation. And uh, I don't know, it, it bugs me. Steve, is it Thomas Wayne? That would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you do the Grant Morrison thing there, but. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just saying that, like, at the very least, if you play the game, the gameplay might be enjoyable enough that you might be able to get through it, you know? Oh, no, I mean, no, no doubt. It's, gonna, it's probably going to be great mechanic-wise. That sounds awesome. I'm, I'm down for that, at the very least, you know? Oh, of course. I mean, I, I can't wait to play with the Batmobile and stuff. I just mean, like, uh, the, 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 the biggest thing I was interested in, aside from gameplay, is who Arkham Knight was. Uh, so now the only thing I have to fall back on is just the sheer enjoyment of the actual gameplay and the system mechanics. Is it Clock King? Oh, it's not Clock King. <laughs> uh, well, folks, that's going to be it for us tonight. I want to thank everybody for uh, being here over on Steve Baxi's channel. Um, Steve uh, has, has uh, been letting me know um, how, how the numbers are, and uh, it looks like we've got uh, about the same numbers as we always do. So thank you guys so much for, for, uh, for showing up and, uh, and hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be here again next week. Um, same uh, uh, us time, same us channel. Um, we will be on Steve Baxi's channel as long as um, as I've got the the, the silly, stupid uh, strike thing over my channel. And um, we are gonna next week uh, talk. About, see, I thought we were doing more rebels, but I guess that's not gonna be coming out anymore. So next week we'll talk about um, the the mini series thing. Uh, at least Steve and I will, and um, we'll talk about whatever uh, Manos is going to pick. And uh, Manos is gonna right now reveal for us uh, what we'll be doing for the Retro Series next week. I'm so excited to find out, Manos, what you've chosen. And uh, go ahead. All right. Uh, we are going to talk about something that uh, was uh, pretty essential to my uh, superhero fandom uh, back in the day when I was a kid. And maybe not the most perfect thing in the world, but uh, I thought it would be fun to talk about. Uh, I would like to talk about the, the pilot for the Nicholas Hammond Spider-Man. Whoa! Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Hopefully, we can all find that. I have found it online, and I can send it to you. Excellent. Yes. Very cool. Uh, Manos, I was really hoping you'd pick that at some point. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, me too. I haven't seen it for a very long time, so uh, I'm curious to see how it doesn't hold up. 
<laughs> I've never seen any of that show, so I'm looking forward to uh, watching it very that's much. That's going to be especially great. <laughs> and talk about that. And uh, that's the show, Manos, where uh, everything reflects off his eyes, right? Uh, he's got the metal uh, oversized with the little dots in it so we can see. Uh, and he's got the web shooters on, out, on the outside of his costume and the belt on, on the outside of his costume. Um, I've never minded that so much. It, it was, it, they had some cool stunt work where they actually got like stuntmen to be uh, <laughs> hauled up onto buildings and you know they pretend to crawl. And they you know they pull them up. Um, so it looks, you know, it, it looks kind of pretty good. Um, he doesn't really web shoot. He doesn't really make too many jokes. He doesn't have any villains. Um, <laughs> yes, no villains. So outside of that, <laughs> other than that, it's great. There's yeah. a Christopher Nolan esque version of the Green Goblin where it's a dude in a suit who just paints his face green. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> If only that had <laughs> happened. The Green Goblin's like, do you feel like you're in control? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that would be great, but the no. The Lido Rises? The <laughs> Lido Rises! Oh, this is CBS in 78. They probably would have got Jamie Farr for that, so it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> probably wouldn't have been a good idea. The good thing about Jamie Farr is you can just paint his face green. I mean, he looks like a goblin. Far <laughs> <laughs> like Willem Dafoe. Yeah. Uh, I, man, I always thought Jamie Farr would have made a great Ferengi. <laughs> Are you sure he didn't? You should check IMDb. Yeah, I should. Maybe he was. Well, anyway, uh, everybody, thanks for watching. We sure appreciate it. We'll see you again next week. I'm Captain Logan, and this was Steve Baxi. See you, everyone. The Real Meadows. Yo. And Dan Tory. Thanks for watching, guys. Dan Tory. Dan Tory. <laughs> Bye.